Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. Now, this is not everybody. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's not time to sleep. Please answer the preacher. Uh-huh. I'm going to say it one more time. Good evening, everyone. God is good. I said God is good. Now, brothers and sisters, when I say God is good, I mean it. Because we serve a powerful God. You know, just before I say thank you, I just want to remind us that our God is still on the throne. Uh, I traveled from the U.S. I left 8.40 p.m. yesterday. And my brothers and sisters, when I got to Amsterdam, my phone... You know, out of, out of the area, but they normally allow me to be able to receive calls wherever I am because I serve as the union youth director. And so when the phone, when the plane touched down at Amsterdam, I got a text. And I said, Lord, I can't read this text. It's lengthy and I need to get off the plane to catch another flight. And something said to me, read the text. When I looked at the text, it's a sister. And this is what she said. I want to read it for you. I know she wouldn't mind, but I want to read the text for you. This is what she said. She said, Pastor McKenzie, it is with a heart filled with gratitude that I humbly extend the biggest thank you to you. God answered each and every prayer of healing that was sent up on my behalf. And I can say, I went this week from a stage four breast cancer to cancer free. Now, you did not hear that, Church of the Living God. And then she went on. This is what she said. She said, my doctors said my results are baffling, unheard of, never seen in all their years of practice. A miracle, not what they were expecting. 100% cancer free. Somebody say hallelujah. Now brothers and sisters, I just want to remind you that we serve a God who is able. And this week we're going to glorify his name. Somebody say hallelujah. We're going to magnify his name. Because he's not a God of stones. He's a living and a real God. To God be the glory. Uh, brothers and sisters, at this time, I would like to personally say thank you to our beloved president, Pastor Emmanuel Osei. Somebody say hallelujah. Uh, brothers and sisters, I travel a lot, visit many, ca many camp meetings, and from the moment I walk into a camp meeting, I can tell how organized they are. And my brothers and sisters, I want to say to you that you have a visionary president. To organize a camp meeting of this magnitude and have it running so smoothly thus far tells of the leadership of the man. Somebody say amen. And so I want to encourage you to continue to pray for your president. This task is not an easy one. It's not an easy one. But as long as we lift him up in prayer, God is going to see him true. Hallelujah. And we want to thank God for his dear wife. She's so pleasant. She sat next to me, a stranger, but yet a brother. And yet she greeted me so warmly, not even knowing who I am. So we want to thank God for you. We want to thank the Lord also for the executive secretary in Pastor Douglas McCormack. 
we also would like to praise the Lord for Pastor Lee, the assistant to the president. This morning when I came out of the airport, my luggage was left in Amsterdam. And so I said, Lord, how will I preach? I have, I don't know how conservative is the congregation. I don't have a shirt. I don't have a tie. <laughs> Somebody say amen. All I had was a t-shirt under my jacket. I said, Lord, how will I preach tonight? You've got to make a way. And as I walked through those doors and I saw the welcoming smile of Dr. Lee, I said to myself, he's welcoming me so warmly. I wonder if his clothing can fit me. <laughs> but then he said to me, don't worry, we're going to take care of you. Got to the hotel and the treasurer came himself. I said the treasurer came himself, Elder Shaw, and took me and fixed me up. I've never had such an expensive tie in a long time. I would like to thank the South England Conference administrators for this invitation to minister to God's people. I also would like to thank my good friend, Pastor Larty. The second time I was privileged to come to this part of the vineyard was at Brixton, where I preached for two weeks. I think we baptized some 20 something folks. It was a wonderful occasion. I'm happy to see our ministerial secretary here and P Pastor McKenzie. I have to check and see if we are brothers, biological brothers. But for now, we will remain brothers in the faith. Amen? To God be the glory. This week, we will cover a few interesting topics at this camp meeting. This evening, we will look at the topic, hold on, no compromise. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? You're looking at the team, retention. And the message this evening, hold on, no compromise. Tomorrow night, we'll look at the topic, hold on, God remembers. Somebody say amen. amen. I said, hold on, God remembers. Amen. Then on Wednesday evening, we must talk about the last days and the latter rain. We will look at the topic, hold on, don't be moved. Hold on, don't be moved. Then we come back on Thursday. The message is entitled, Hold On, All Is Not Lost. And then I rest on Friday night, but we have a big communion here. And I come back on Sabbath. Am I correct? And the message is entitled, Hold On, God Will Turn It Around. <laughs> Hallelujah. To God be the glory. My brothers and sisters, before we speak tonight, since I'm one who believe in prayer, I would like us to stand wherever we are, wherever we are this evening. I want to ask us if we can turn in groups of twos or if you feel comfortable praying individually, but if we can pray in groups, groups of twos and we can ask God to move in a mighty way this week. Somebody say Amen. Ask God to use the preachers this week and ask the Lord to have us leave with a blessing at the end of this camp meeting. Just take a prayer partner if you may or adopt an appropriate prayer posture and let us talk to God. Just for a few seconds and then I'll pray and we'll go into the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great God and Father. We thank you, Lord, for sparing our lives. We thank you for watching over us on the busy streets. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us into this place where we can worship you. We pray in a mighty way that your Holy Spirit will 
tabernacle with us this week. Bring us close to you. Show us your way. Prepare us for the kingdom. I ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us spiritually this week. Take us back to our homes, our churches, on fire, motivated to e evangelize and lead others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless your word even now. We thank you for the blessing thus far. We thank you for the singing of your young people. What a wonderful special item of music. We pray now, Lord, that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 4. As we look at the topic, hold on, no compromise. When I walked into this place, I'm still happy to know that we have Seventh-day Adventists who are holding on to the beliefs that God imparted to us. I thank God that we still believe in the 28 fundamental beliefs. Somebody say amen. We still believe in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The message, hold on to what you have. Don't compromise. First Samuel, chapter 4. And we are reading from verse 10. Do you have it, everybody? And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Are you reading, church? And the ark, everybody say the ark. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phineas was slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, what meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old. And his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army. And I fled today out of the army. And he said, what is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines. And there had been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward 
by the side of the gate. And his neck break. And he died. For he was an old man. And heavy. And he had judged Israel 40 years. And his daughter-in-law Phineas wife. Was with child. Near to be delivered. And when she heard. The tidings. That the ark of God was taken. And that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She bowed herself and travailed. For her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death. The woman stood. The woman that stood by her said unto her. Fear not. For thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she said, name the child Ichabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken. And because her father-in-law and her, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. The message today is entitled, Hold On, No Compromise. Or you can simplify it as hold on to what you have. Don't compromise. My brothers and sisters, have you ever heard the story of a guy, a young man, during the Civil War. He could not have made up his mind which side to fight on. Whether to fight for the North or the South. And so what he did, he put on the trousers of the South. And the coat of the north and went out to battle. What happened? He was shot at from both sides. This is what happens to the compromiser. This is what happens when you want to live in two worlds. The Seventh-day Adventist church must not strive to live as though they are holding on to two worlds. Is anybody listening to the preacher? You've got to make up your mind. No compromise. The church must know what it believes and stand for what's right. No compromise. And so the message, hold on to what you have. No compromise. Let's pray one more time, everybody. Father, bless your word and bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Theologians tell us one of the greatest homecomings was when the ark, I said, when the ark that represented the glory of God was captured by Israel's enemies. But true divine intervention returned home. So grand and glorious was that homecoming that David could not have contained himself. The Bible tells us he danced out of his clothes. A church, permit me this evening to leave with you three points regarding God's people and the ark. Point number one, call to glory. Israel was called. 
chosen by God to carry his glory. And they carried his glory in the form of the ark. The ark of the covenant. God told them how to carry the ark. There were rings on the ark for poles to be inserted. So the priests could have carried the ark. Only the priests must carry the ark. The people were instructed to remain at a distance of 1,000 feet from the ark or else the glory would strike them down. God told them how to carry the ark, how to carry the glory. The other nations, they carried idols and images, but God's people were chosen to carry the glory. Somebody say hallelujah. I stopped by here today to tell somebody that like Israel of old, we spiritual Israel are chosen by God in these, the closing scenes of earth's history to carry his glory. Glory is both an adjective and a verb. As an adjective, it describes one of God's attributes that tell of his power and might. My brothers and sisters, God has one main medium through which he manifests his power and his might. And that medium is through his children. Somebody say hallelujah. It therefore means that when folks see us, they must see something different about us. When folks see how we dress, how we conduct ourselves, how we act, they must see something different about us. I want to tell the church of God today, when folks see how we carry ourselves, they must see evidence of the recreative power of God. The things I used to do, I do them no more. There's a great change since I've been born again. I'm talking about evidence of the recreative power of God. Glory is also a verb. It tells what we give God. We give him glory. When we give him praise, when we testify, we are giving him glory. And I want to tell somebody here today that all glory belongs to God. I'll say that again. I said all glory belongs to God. Don't be like the foolish woodpecker. One day the woodpecker flew on a tree. Give the tree three pecks. And after the three pecks, he realized that it was difficult to bring this tree down. The other woodpeckers on another tree looked at him and started to mock him. He felt embarrassed because three of his pecks could not have brought the tree down. He flew on another tree, bowed his head in embarrassment as the woodpeckers laugh at him. And then suddenly, lightning flashed and thunder rolled and a lightning bolt cut the tree down. The woodpeckers were all startled. Then the woodpecker looked at the other woodpeckers and said, who would have thought that three of my pecks would bring this tree down. <laughs> he took the glory. <laughs> but I want to tell somebody here today that all glory belongs to God. <laughs> somebody say hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, Israel, Israel was chosen by God. Given the privilege to carry the ark, to carry the glory. But the Bible tells us that they lost the glory. They lost the ark. I want to tell somebody here today, don't lose the glory. I'll say it one more time. 
South England Conference. Don't lose the glory. I've seen some folks, after God blessed them, when they were poor, they were humble. When they had nothing, they worshiped God with all their hearts. When there were nobodies, they served well in the church. But the moment God blessed them, I said the moment God blessed them, the moment God blessed them with a degree, the moment God blessed them with a job, for some reason they become high and lifted up and they lose the glory. I want to tell somebody, don't lose the glory. Keep Jesus in his rightful place. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh, I've seen churches. I've seen churches like the early church. God was blessing the church. But then the church lost the glory. The church merged with the state. Church leaders became so haughty that they called themselves vicars of Christ. Church councils took the place of the Bible. Sunday took the place of the Sabbath. Idol worship seep into the church and the church lost its glory. I stopped by the tell Southern South England Conference. Keep the standards of God high and don't lose the glory. Keep God in his rightful place. I said keep Jesus in his rightful place. In everything you do, just lift him up. When you preach about creation, tell them he is created. When you preach about the state of the dead, tell them he lives again. When you preach about the Sabbath, tell them he is Lord of the Sabbath. When you preach about the sanctuary, tell them we have a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. When you preach about the coming of Christ, you tell them our Lord shall come and shall not keep silent. When you preach about heaven, tell the world... He's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Keep God in his rightful place. Lift him up. Don't lose the glory. God has been good to you. He has been good to this church. And he blessed us. Somebody say amen. So we've got to keep him in his rightful place. The young lady who sent me that text, I remember when she found out she had cancer. She said, Pastor, I, I, I had lost my way. She said, I lost my way. But now I'm back. Somebody say amen. She said, now I'm back to lift up the name of the Lord. She said, I lost my way. I want to tell you something. Whenever you lose the presence of God in your life or in your church, you will lose your way and the devil will have his way. So keep God in his rightful place. First point, called to glory. Israel was called, chosen by God to carry the glory, to carry the ark. But the Bible tells us they lost the ark. The second point, fall from glory. Why did they, why did they lose the ark? Why did they lose what God gave them? Why did they lose the glory? Well, church of the living God, they lost the glory because the church, God's people, had become just like the world. They muddled after the world. Instead of the world muddling after the church, they compromise their standards and their beliefs. And so they lost the glory. 
How did they compromise? Well, church, listen to this carefully. When they saw the other nations going to battle with their idols and their images, they, instead of depending on the omnipresent God, they decided that they will do the same. The worst thing can happen to the church is when the church starts to look at the world and decide to do the same. And that's the problem with the church. God has chosen us to carry the glory. In other words, to be the leaders. But many times we find ourselves compromising and have the world seeping into the church. We look at other religions and other things in the world and suddenly we want to become like them. God wants them to become like us. Israel looked at the other nations and when they saw them going to battle with their idols and their images, instead of depending on the omnipresent God, they said they want to do the same. And so when they went to battle with the Philistines, I said when they went to battle with the Philistines and they lost some 4,000 Israelites, they said it's because the Philistines went to battle with their idol, with their image, with their God. Let us go to battle with our idol. Let us go to battle with our image. Let us go to battle with our God. And then one of them said, who is this? And the other said, the ark of the covenant, as though God can be locked up in a box. God never told them that he is the ark. He told them that it is a symbol of his glory. God never told them to bring the ark to battle for their safety was not in the ark of the Lord but in the Lord of the ark. Some trust in chariots and some in horses but we I said but we will trust in the name of our God. Somebody say hallelujah. When they grabbed the ark and they went to battle with the Philistines, the Bible tells us that there was a great slaughter. The Philistines slaughtered some 30,000 Israelites. The Philistines had a bloodbath. And the Philistines did not stop there. The Philistines grabbed the ark. Are you listening to me, church? They grabbed the ark that represented the glory of God. The Philistines grabbed the ark as they were going with the ark down to the Philistines' territory. The Philistines' camp, an Israelite soldier who pretended to be dead, he got up and he ran over hills and valleys with blood flowing down his head, blood flowing down his side. When he got to the Israelites' camp, he found the women lying the streets waiting for news of the battle. He said, I can't talk now. Where is Eli, the priest? He said, where is Eli, the old priest? They said, Eli is just at the corner of the road. He is seated on a chair. The wounded, blood-stained soldier ran to Eli, met the old priest, 98 years of age, can't even see, met him sitting on a chair. Eli said, give me the news. The blood-stained soldier said, Eli, your sons, Hophni and Phineas, they are dead. Eli bowed his head 
and started to weep. And then the soldier said, Eli, that's not all. Eli said, speak on, son. He said, Eli, the ark of the covenant that represents the glory of God. The Philistines took the ark. They took the glory. Eli threw back his head, fell off his chair, broke his neck, and died because the glory had departed from Israel. The soldier ran to Phineas' wife who was with child and he said to her, he said your husband, uh, your husband Phineas is dead. The woman said, is there any other news? He said yes. He said the Philistines uh, took the ark of the covenant the glory of God immediately she went into labor, dying in child's birth. She gave birth to a son. The attendant asked her, what shall we name him? She said, don't name him after his son. Don't name him after his father, his grandfather. Don't name him after the people. You name him Ichabod, for it means the glory has departed from Israel. Church, when the glory is not in the place, tragedies will have their way. When the glory is not in the place, the devil will go on a rampage. But once the glory, I said once the presence of God is in your house, once the presence of God is in your church, once the presence of God is in your workplace, everything is going to be all right. It may seem as though you are going downhill, but God is still, I said God is still in charge. Somebody say hallelujah. The Philistines took the ark of the covenant. Why did they take it? Why did they take the ark? Well, the Philistines were looking at the Israelites for years. And they reasoned that the reason the Israelites were blessed was because of the ark. And so what they did, they decided that they will take the ark they will take the blessing. In other words, they coveted the blessing. But the Bible tells us everywhere they took the ark, they suffered. There were tragedies. They took the ark to Ashdod. And Pastor Lati, when the ark got there, their God Dagon, who they had high and lifted up, he fell off of what they had him on. <laughs> broke up his hands, broke up his legs, broke up his body. The folks in Ashdod said, look, get that ark out of here. They then took the ark down to God. And when they got down to God, everybody started to break out with cancer tumors. The folks in God said, look, get that ark out of here. They then took the ark down to Ekron. And when they got down to Ekron, a tragedies started. Eventually, the Philistines said, could somebody tell the Israelites to come and get the ark? Our church of the living God, you tell your neighbor, don't covet my blessing. Because if you covet my blessing, it will become your curse. Is anybody listening to me? Don't covet my position. Don't covet my status. Don't covet my wife. Don't covet my family. Don't covet my home. Or else it will become your, your curse. For who God bless, no man curse. The Israelites 
had to lift one finger to get back the ark. The Philistines themselves, they said, tell the Israelites to come and take their ark. Church, when you trust God, you don't have to fight your battles. The battle belongs to the Lord. When you trust God, you don't have to run after blessings. You just have to stand and wait and see that the Lord is good. When you trust God, you don't have to fight your enemies. You just have to get down on your knees. Is anybody listening to me? Because the Bible says the battle is the Lord's. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, I'm done with fighting. I will now start trusting. I'm done with gossiping. I'll now start believing because I, st I serve a God who will fight my battles. The Philistine said, come. Come in peace. And you will go in peace. <laughs> you come and take your ark. <laughs> Nobody is going to touch you. <laughs> you just make your way <laughs> and grab the ark. David got excited. I said, David got excited. And David grabbed his soldiers. He said, we are going for the ark. He left the priest home. <laughs> are you listening to me? <laughs> you got to understand that if you're going to carry the glory, you got to know how to handle it. If you're going to carry the glory, you have to know how to carry it. Are you listening to me? If you're going to carry the glory, you've got to know how to deal with it. David grabbed his soldiers and he rushed down to the Philistines' camp to get the glory. When he got down there, the Philistines said, boy, just take your ark. And they put the ark on an ox cart as though God, as though they were following God. When God said that there are rings on the ark for the priest to carry the ark. David and his men, they placed the ark on an ox cart. There are some folks in God's church who just love to do things their way. Is anybody listening to me? They believe they know it all. And so they just want to do it their way. But I want to tell you, when it comes to handling holy things and dealing with God's sacred vessels, it's not how you want to do it. It's how God says it must be done. My brothers and sisters, they put the ark on an ox cart. And when the ox cart started, it hit a bump in the road. And the ark started to tilt as though it wanted to fall off. You know the story. Uzzah, he reached out to hold up the ark. My brothers and sisters, he had good intentions. But God doesn't honor good intentions. God honors obedience. Is anybody listening to me? I heard folks say, I have good intentions to use the tithe. Well, you have it wrong. What God honors is not your good intentions, but your obedience. Bring your other tithe into the storehouse. It's obedience. You could find many things to use the tithe for. With good intentions. You see, God doesn't need our money. So when we return tithe, it's not about our money. It's about our obedience. Somebody say hallelujah. God did not need the priest to carry the ark. He could just bid the ark go. But what he honors is obedience. Somebody say amen. 
And so, my brothers and sisters, as we reach out to hold up the ark, good intentions. But the Bible tells us that God, the glory, struck him dead. When David saw it, David told the man, he told the man, he said, hold on, hold on. We're not ready to take the glory. We've got to go and study again. Is anybody listening to me? We've got to go and read the scriptures again so we can know how to handle the glory. They left the ark at a man's house named Odem Edom. Are you listening to me? And when they left the ark at Odem's house, everything in Odem's house got blessed. His dogs got blessed. His cats got blessed. His money got blessed. His children got blessed. His bills got blessed. His family got blessed. His neighbors got blessed. Because the glory of the Lord was in the house. Tell your neighbor, I've got to keep God's presence in my house. Because I need the blessings of the Lord. I need the blessings on my bills. I need the blessings on my children. I need the blessings on my health. I need the blessings on my home. I need the blessings in the church. And so I keep the glory of the Lord in the house. Somebody say hallelujah. David went home. And David and the men studied. In the meanwhile, Odem enjoying the ark. Somebody say hallelujah. Odem was not touching the ark. All Odem was doing was keeping the ark, the glory of the Lord, in the house. And his children were excelling in school. His bills were being taken care of. I tell folks, I don't need the favor of man. I don't need the well wishes of people. I don't need to get into politics to get position. I I don't need folks to favor me. All I need is the glory of the Lord in my life, and everything is going to be all right. The church, David got the priest. He said to the priest, Could I preach for five more minutes? He said to the priests, he said to them, he said, listen, we're going to go to the ark, and you are going to carry the ark. We're going to keep back 1,000 feet. We're going to do it how God says. Is anybody listening to me? And my brothers and sisters, they went for the ark. The priest pushed the poles through the rings. And they started off with the ark. The Israelites lined the streets. I said the Israelites lined the streets. And they were praising God for the glory of God. And David was saying in his mind, now I have the ark back. Now I have the glory back. I will hold on and never let go. I said, I will hold on and never let go. The Bible tells us that David did something that upset his wife. He started to dance out of his clothes. Come on, David. His wife sat at her window. She was getting ready to come down to praise the Lord. But then when she looked out and she saw this man, this high and dignified king, this man who is so exalted, this man who is so respected, she saw how he brought himself, now dancing out of his clothes, and she said to herself, I ain't going down there to worship with him, I ain't going down there to celebrate with him, church of the living God, she had it wrong, she had her eyes on David, instead of having her eyes on Jesus, can I tell somebody, if you put your eyes on man, they will fail you. They will disappoint you. But if you keep your eyes, I said if you keep your eyes, I said if you keep your eyes on a man named Jesus, he never failed me yet. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. And so she said, I ain't coming down because of one man. There are folks who say, I ain't going back to that church 
because of one incident. I'm going to close now. I ain't going back to that church because of one person. I ain't going back to that church because of one problem. You have it wrong. The problem with the Adventist church is that we don't know where to look. We like to look at people. We like to look at things. You've got to know where to look. I said, you've got to know where to look. Uh, Brother President, I read a story the other day. It was about a plane that was flying. And anytime you read about planes, I like to see because my job puts me on a plane ever so often. And so I'm concerned about planes. I read the story. The plane was flying some 30,000 feet high. And when the plane got to cruising altitude, the seatbelt sign was switched off. Now, those of you who love to fly, you will know that if you see the seatbelt sign still on, then something is iffy. Are you listening to me? Maybe turbulence on the way. Maybe something not right. But the moment you see that sign switches off, you get relaxed. Are you listening to me? And so on 30,000 feet high, the seatbelt sign switched off. The flight attendant, she left the front and she walked to the back. And Pastor Lartie, she went to get the snacks to feed the passengers. But when she got to the back, she noticed a strange cargo on board. When she looked closely, she saw the cargo had some deadly snakes. And the snakes had started to make their way out of the cargo, heading to the aisle where the passengers were. The flight attendant, she dropped the lunch, but the snack basket, and she ran to the cockpit. She said, pilot and co-pilot, you guys better land this plane. There are some deadly snakes on board, and if you don't land the plane, the snakes will eat us up. The pilots rage down to the towers, and the pilots said, Make way for emergency landing. There's some deadly snakes on board. The guy in the tower, he said, just hold on a few more minutes. Allow me to consult the snake experts. And then I'll call you back. After a few minutes, the guy raged back to the pilots. He said, we consulted the snake experts. And the experts said, you better don't land that plane. They said, if you land the plane, the snakes would eat you up. Uh, then he said, what must we do? He said, the experts said, turn the nose of the plane heavenwards and press the X heavenwards because there's an altitude where snakes can't live. I stopped by here today to tell somebody, stop looking at your problems and look to Jesus because there's an altitude where problems can't live. Stop looking at your enemies and look to Jesus because there's an attitude where your enemies can't live. David said, I look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. If I look to the front, I'll be discouraged. If I look behind me, I'll get frustrated. If I look at the side of me, I lose hope. But if I look up, somebody say hallelujah. I said if I look up, I will see the man called Jesus. And don't only look up, but press the X heaven words and if anybody asks you where you are pressing you tell them I'm pressing on the upward way new heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I'm onward bound Lord Lord plant my feet 
on higher ground. Somebody say hallelujah. South England Conference, don't compromise. I said don't compromise. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't compromise with trials. Look to Jesus. Don't compromise with your enemies. Look to Jesus. Don't compromise with your needs. Look to Jesus. I want to pray for somebody today because God told me to tell you he has given you as a church a special privilege of carrying his glory and don't ever compromise. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Could I pray for somebody today? You want to say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray that God will give me the strength to carry the glory in my house. Pray that God will give me the strength to carry the glory in my church. Pray that he would give me the strength that when I walk into my job, they will see the glory of God. Pray that he would give me the strength not to compromise. If there's somebody like that today, why not stand wherever you are? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you wherever you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, my sister. Praise God, my sister. Now, brothers and sisters, I know I'm in a camp meeting, but I want to make another call. Is that okay? Is there somebody here today? Maybe you walked out of this church. You put down the glory. You put down the presence of God. And now you want to say, Jesus, I'm coming home. I'm coming back to take up the glory and to walk with the glory. I want to give my life back to Jesus. Wherever you are, come. I want to pray for you. Wherever you are, I want to say I want to give my life back to Jesus. Is there anybody like that here today? Is there any such person? Come, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Every head bow and every eye closed. My brothers and sisters, I want you to talk to God just for one minute yourself. Tell him, God, fill me with your spirit. Help me to carry your glory the way you desire me to carry it. Thank you, my sister. We're going to ask our beloved president, our beloved president to pray for his flock, that God will, God will help us to hold on to what we have as a church and never let go and keep Jesus in his rightful place. And keep our eyes on Jesus. But the president, God bless you as you pray for the flock he has entrusted in your care. Let us pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, tonight we say thank you for the words that have come directly from your throne. We thank you for the glory that you have entrusted to us. We thank you, O oh God, that tonight we can make a commitment to you and say that by the grace of God, we will keep our eyes on Jesus. Father, forgive us where we have failed you in times past, where we have looked at others instead of looking to you. Father, I pray that tonight, as we make this commitment to renew our dedication, that you will accept us, you will speak to our hearts, and you will draw us closer to you. Tonight, we want to pray in a very special way for our sisters who have come forward making this public commitment that even though they may have wandered away from you tonight, they are saying, Lord Jesus, I come just as I am. Bless them immensely, I pray. Put your loving arms around them, O oh God. Give them the assurance of your continued presence. And I want to pray, O oh God, for others who might be struggling.
to make such a decision. You know our very hearts. So God, as we open ourselves to you, we ask, oh God, that you will come into our hearts. Make your abode within us. May we enjoy the sweet communion with you as we walk this road. Tonight has been an exceptional night, a foretaste of what we will experience throughout this week. Father, save us, bless us, and may our communion with you be sweet. Watch over us now as we bring this part of the service to a close. May your presence continue to be with us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.